Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We'll be talking about how to secure your software supply chain at scale. I'm Hamil, and I'm a software engineer at Yahoo Security Team. And this is my colleague. Uh, hi, I'm Yonghe, also from Yahoo Security Team. And our security team is also known as the Paranoids. And here is our logo for identifying us. We are very excited to be here. All right, so here's the agenda for today. By the end of this talk, we would like to show you how a lot of the existing open source tools can be deployed and integrated with your existing ecosystem, and also some of the policies one can create to uh, safeguard against some of the supply chain attacks. So let's get started. So what is the software supply chain? Software supply chain is made up of everything and everyone that touches your code as part of software development lifecycle beginning from application development to CI-CD pipeline, and eventually deployment to production. It also includes information about the software, like components, uh, the source, the people who wrote the source code, and sources where they come from. It includes information about the known vulnerabilities, supported versions, and so on. Basically everything that touches it uh, at some point. So what is the problem and what are the various attacks that are possible in the software supply chain? There are quite a lot of places an attacker can target your infrastructure, starting from compromising your source code system, example being the PHP's Git server when they were attacked, or compromising your build system, uh, recentish example being the SolarWinds attack. Or they could also trick users to use bad artifacts, which is known as typo squatting, and that's been happening often in package managers. So why is software supply chain security important to us? These are some of the recent attacks and headlines uh, related to software supply chain security. At the bottom, you can see the most recent attack on PyTorch, where a nightly version of PyTorch, which was released during the holiday season, most likely had a rogue package, which was able to siphon off some sensitive data from user system. This attack is known as dependency confusion, and that's been affecting a lot of the development environments and package managers. Right at the top, uh, you can see the one for where there was a well-planned spear phishing attack, uh, where they were able to attack more than 130 organizations and were able to get around 10,000 Okta and 2FA credentials. So here's an obligatory slide showing you some scary figures. Industry data suggests anywhere between 85 to 97% of enterprise code base is using open source. This means that most of your application consists of code that you didn't write. The vulnerabilities in third party or open source dependencies can pose a significant security risk. Supply chain attacks are on the rise, and according to the recent report by Sonatype, the supply chain attacks have gone up by 742% uh, year over year over the last three years. Three out of five companies have been targeted uh, due to the supply chain attacks based on uh, Anchor's report as well. So what is the industry doing in order to secure software supply chain? Actually, quite a lot. So there are a lot of great tools and resources, especially open source and proprietary with a wealth of security guidance and resources that can help aid in one's security journey. Uh, recently, CNCF Technical Advisory Group also published a document that lists down all publications and references that could help one in their journey, especially it has information like the policies, security assessments, use cases, and best practices. However, it can be really hard and intimidating to find the right choices for your company or your situation, especially when a lot of these tools either have overlap of functionality or one tool depends on the other. In a, in a company where the infrastructure is already set up, it's really challenging and difficult to figure out how to integrate these tools in their existing ecosystem. When we at Yahoo were starting our journey in software supply chain security, we faced a similar conundrum, and my colleague here will talk more about what tools we used and how we integrated in our existing ecosystem. 
Yeah. Thanks, Hamo. Yeah, Yahoo indeed has a large software span system. We are supporting yahoo.com, which is amongst the top 10 visited website in the world. We have a lot of services and products serving high load traffic. Internally, there are about uh, 60,000 build jobs running and uh, about 5,000 images published to the registry on a daily basis. And at the same time, there are more than 700 Kubernetes clusters running more than 100,000 pods. And that is still now the whole picture of Yahoo software suspension. There are still a lot of other kinds of artifacts not being deployed to the Kubernetes clusters, like to the on-prem virtual machines. So um, Yahoo software suspension scale is large, not only in, in, in the data quantity, but also in terms of tooling choices. Within Yahoo, we have different teams with different requirements and needs, and each team may have their own path to deliver their software. So this diagram lists uh, some of the major tools we are using at Yahoo, from source code management tools, build systems, artifact stores, and finally, the deployment environment. The variety of tools makes securing software suspension of Yahoo challenging. So uh, we must simplify the problem at hand. When we first started our journey, we decided to pilot the security measures and uh, um, produce real value in a certain uh, software suspension path. We chose the cloud native path. That is uh, GitHub Enterprise as source code management tool, screwdriver as a build pipeline, internal outside registry as a artifact store, and uh, Finally, Kubernetes as a deployment environment. For those who are not aware, uh, Screwdriver is a, a CSAD platform built and open source by Yahoo. You can also find this project on the CNCF Cloud Native Landscape website, and it is also widely used internally at Yahoo. Okay, so as we all know, software supply chain security has a lot of aspects. Even if uh, we have only one path, uh, there are still a lot of security controls and uh, best practice to follow. Um, but luckily, we do not need to start from scratch because we have already had some fundamental security controls in place, like static code scanning, uh, repo branch protection, to request rewards, and so on. So after evaluating the existing security controls uh, and open source standards, we realized there were three major gaps. Firstly, uh, even if we have static code scanning to check the proprietary code, we are not able to detect the vulnerabilities in our open source dependencies. So we decided to introduce Software Composition Analysis, SCA, to fill this gap. In addition, we are not able to check the software and block the deployment after the code is released from the repository. So to fill this gap, we decided to uh, add two checkpoints in our software development lifecycle, one in the build stage, another in the deployment stage. Uh, we will walk you through for these three gaps. What did we do uh, in the following slide? Uh, first, software composition analysis, also known as SA. As Hamel said earlier, most, uh, 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 most of our application consists of code we didn't write. Traditional code scanning will just look at the flow and the logic of your proprietary code and report if there is any potential vulnerabilities. It will not look at the open source dependencies. So that's why we need a, a software composition analysis to fill this gap because those tools, can, uh, those tools will only focus on the open source dependencies vulnerability check uh, they can identify the open source dependencies, package names, and digest, check against the vulnerability database, and finally report uh, if they, they find any issue. They could also uh, probably raise pull requests to bump up the version of your open source dependencies, which will, in most cases, uh, can fill, uh, fix the potential vulnerabilities. Uh, so by applying uh, SA tools, we make the progress of detecting and remediating uh, vulnerabilities in our application code much easier. Uh, however, 
the images that will be deployed to the Kubernetes clusters will always have uh, components other than the application binary, like a base operating system and any other package you could add. So having a, a build-time vulnerability assessment to, hand, uh, to scan the whole image is very necessary because it can uh, not only catch the vulnerability not solved in your application code, but also the uh, issues in those extra components that are integrated during the build time. In practice, we use SIFT and GRIPE to generate SBOM and vulnerability data to do the assessment. We also provide an option to block a specific pipelines uh, if we found any severe vulnerability. So in the next time, if another log4j crisis occurs, we can take actions and uh, prevent those vulnerable uh, images from being published to our registry. Okay, so uh, after we have some guardrails in place in both source code management tools and the uh, build system, we would like to check all the uh, images that will be deployed to our Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so there are, there, are, there are a lot of use cases. For example, uh, if an image is not signed or it is from an untrusted re uh, registry or it still contains any unsolved vulnerabilities, we can block it or at least uh, inform the I inform engineers for those violations. To achieve the deployment time verification, we utilize uh, dynamic admission control in Kubernetes. It allows us to uh, implement HTTP webhook uh, that can uh, receive admission requests, check against predefined policies, and finally decide whether or not to deploy, deploy a resource. Uh, and in practice, we use both uh, Yahoo proprietary webhook and uh, Kiverno to achieve our goal. So let's talk about some of the checks we do during the deployment time. First one is uh, ensuring provenance of images exist. Provenance is a bunch of records that tell you where this image comes from. It can include information like who commits the code, which repo and branch is this image originally from, build information, and so on. We collect uh, our provenance data from GitHub, Screwdriver, and Registry. Basically covers all three major steps in our uh, software supply chain. And those data are stored in the you know, provenance database. And this uh, provenance uh, store is based on Graphias, which is an open source uh, project that standardizes provenance format along with uh, API and backend solution. So here is a demo for uh, showing you how permanence check can secure you from some attack. Okay, in this demo, we will deploy we will deploy three images. The first one does not have prominence. The second one has a complete prominence, but it is problematic. The third one has a complete prominence. We design these three uh, policies to verify these three image deployments correspondingly. And the first two images are the malicious cases, and the third one is a positive case, a good case. So uh, this is the first one. This image is uh, uploaded directly uh, by an attacker to the registry without passing through the expected CSAD pipeline. So in this case, our webhook cannot get any provenance data from our database. So it will reject the deployment. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, uh, in the error message, you can see there's no resource repo or build job information found. And uh, the second image, this image is built and uploaded uh, from a forked repo with uh, malicious changes. In this case, even if this image has a uh, complete provenance, but it will show this image is already f originally from a uh, forked repo, but not a trusted repo. So our webhook will still reject this because, uh, based on our po policy. 
uh, as you can see in the error message, it says source uh, repo mismatch. We uh, find it is from a fork repo, but actually uh, we expect it to uh, hit from a trusted repo. Okay, lastly, this image is built from a valid source and pipeline finally locates in a trusted registry. In this case, this image has a complete provenance and the provenance information has no problem. So our webhook will uh, allow the deployment. Okay, this is the uh, end of this demo. And second check is the image signature check. We want to make sure all images uh, that have been deployed to the Kubernetes clusters are signed during the uh, in the in the build system, because it can help us verify the integrity integrity and uh, publisher of the images. Yahoo currently uses a uh, self-managed the long-lived kit to sign the image sign the images, and this signing flow has been integrated to most of our standard templates that build and publish images. Actually, this mechanism, signing mechanism has been existing for a long time, but there was no enforcement to verify the signature before uh, deployment. So this check can also fill this gap. Uh, here's a demo for this. Uh, firstly, because the signature check is directly integrated to uh, the webhook, so there's no policy shown as a previous demo. In this uh, signature check demo, we will deploy two images. The first one is not signed in the build pipeline, so our webhook cannot find a signature attached to this image in our signature database. So uh, it will reject it. And the second image uh, was signed in the build system. So our webhook will allow the deployment. Okay, so here comes the third <laughs> image first uh, image first and check. The motivation behind this check is to uh, encourage people to upgrade their image regularly because an older image will usually have more vulnerabilities. And uh, if you uh, didn't uh, update your image for, uh, for a long time, by the time you have to make the security fix, you may find the uh, patch delta is too huge and it's very difficult and risky to make the change. Uh, lastly, uh, by regularly updating your uh, image, you have to trigger your build pipeline. So by doing so, you can uh, notice your build pipeline issue in time. To achieve the image freshness check, we utilize the Kvernal and Kvernal policies. Uh, here is uh, another demo for the freshness check. Uh, firstly, this is a Kvernal policy for this check. You can see it is it's just uh, uh, block any image built more than six months ago. You can also find this policy on the Kiverno official website. Okay, in this the demo, we will uh, also deploy two images. The first one is built about a year ago, <laughs> so it is too stale. In this case, uh, Kiverno will reject it simply because it's built more than six months ago. And uh, the other uh, image is built within a month. So Kiverno will allow it. Okay, so the checks that we were showing you uh, in the deployment time or in the, even in the uh, build time are by no means expect, expected to be the full story. We could choose to evaluate nearly arbitrary policies with uh, necessary data. 
So for example, if you want to achieve vulnerability check during the deployment time, um, we are actually ingesting vulnerability data to our GraphQL database so that our webhook can fetch and validate vulnerability data along with the provenance data. And uh, for uh, this, the next two checks, they can all be uh, uh, achieved by applying a single kernel policy. Okay, so here's uh, the end for the details and demos. Uh, now my colleague Emil will summarize our work so far. Thanks, Yongo. So just a brief summary on what tools we have been using and uh, the timeline on how we reached there. We started our journey by around mid-2020. Uh, when we started our journey, not a lot of open source tools and solutions were available. So we built a lot of in-house tooling and also used Graphius as the provenance store. By, by early mid-2021, we were able to collect most of the source provenance and around 10% of the build provenance were uh, through our build pipelines. Later, 2021, we open source Graphius RDS, which adds supports to Postgres database with Graphius. Uh, uh, early 2022, Sixtor had emerged as a really promising uh, solution for both signing container images and also attesting software. So we started exploring that internally for some of our build pipelines. And while doing that, we were also working on adding deployment checks, which Yongha showed earlier. So we use both Kiverno and Yahoo's uh, proprietary uh, policy checks. Later that year and beginning this year, we've incorporated some of the cosine functionality to our existing build pipelines and are also working on Guac for visualizing the SBOM data, which is generated by SIFT and Gripe. So what did we learn from our journey so far? Given the hybrid environment at Yahoo with different teams learn, working on different projects and different tools, we faced quite a few interesting challenges and few lessons were learned during our journey as well. The first one is enhancing existing developer workflows automatically. If the tool being built can do its job behind the scenes or if it's it can be integrated with the tools itself. It reduces the onboarding and learning efforts by developers. And by doing that, we reduce the friction between the security team and the development team because they don't need to update their projects on a regular basis, and this can be done behind the scenes. This also helps us in reducing the time we go to market or we go to actually the deployment time. Uh, an example to showcase this lesson is when we started collecting the provenance, uh, as mentioned earlier, we, we use Graphius. So we integrated uh, source metadata collection as part of GitHub webhooks. And for getting the build metadata, we integrated it with the build teardown steps. So any build which runs in Yahoo was able to send the provenance to the Graphius store. That way, it gave us around 70 to 80 percent of provenance. Uh, the remaining 20 is because they don't use the standard tooling. Uh, and the same when we tried to do for admission webhook, uh, the problem is a lot of the individual teams and owners have their own clusters running. And in order to add the webhook to their clusters, we had to work with individual teams. That, that took a lot of time because the priorities were different. And Eventually, it took us around six months to make the webhook as default. So that brings me to my next point. Uh, that is, and one of the most important lessons we've learned is around adoption uh, and adoption of tools and services like the admission webhook across the company. If, even if there is a small portion of the company which is not onboarded to uh, using these tools, we may still be susceptible to software supply chain attacks. So we need to ensure that everyone in the tea company uses or gets onboarded to the admission webhook. An example for this being, we made the webhook as default for all EKS deployments, uh, but there were some other teams which were using non-standard tools or different deployments. So for, in order for them to be onboarded, we had to either 
create a Helm chart so that they can install it manually, or we needed to get behind them to make sure they can actually adopt it. So it's still a challenge, and we are still working on increasing the adoption within the company. Uh, a follow-up to that is, uh, follow-up to the pre-planning is uh, ensuring that there is enough visibility of the project. Uh, if we need to convey the business value to the execs, uh, periodic status up update of the project to the stakeholders is important. And along with selling the overall mission, we also need to demonstrate the incremental value of the project. The next one, and an important one, is embracing open source technologies. A lot of the solutions or tools which we use for so software supply chain security are already available as part of open source tools. So embracing open source, so source technologies is quite important. Uh, we, we should engage with the open source community and also try to make meaningful contributions that increases the expertise in that and also gives back to the community. And the last one is around continuous feedback. So performing continuous testing on your solution and getting periodic feedback from stakeholders is important. Ensuring the requirements and use cases are covered is important to the success of the project. Yeah, the, this project has truly been a team effort and there are a few folks uh, for we would like to thank just for the guidance and yeah thank you <laughs> questions Go ahead. Did you sure so uh, OPA is a great tool, and it's quite powerful. So when we started our journey, we, we started working with OPA. Uh, but as we proceeded, we, we realized that uh, OPA is so powerful, and the needs what we have is not as uh, granular which OPA offers. And also, uh, it, as learning a new language, since OPA needs to have some expertise for learning the language, uh, it wasn't easy to adopt and add more policies uh, because at the end of the day, it's not just the security folks who would be adding the policies, but we wanted to make it such that any admin could add more policies to their own clusters. So by using our in-house and Keyverno policies, it, it's quite intuitive and uh, self uh, easy to learn. But in the future, we may revisit OPA if, if we think that's the need. But. Yeah, yeah, for permanence check, uh, as I show in the uh, in the demo, so there are basically three, uh, uh, not three, maybe but several checks. So um, we can check the uh, source source, uh, source repo uh, information and build pipeline information, and uh, can what what uh, what the registry is is it from, and uh, actually for the Provenance, but not from Provenance, but uh, during the, um, there's an, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, d d data stored in the GraphQL database is uh, vulnerability data. So we can just fetch vulnerability data along with the provenance data. It is not provenance, but we can check with provenance. We can set some uh, policies that we want to block a certain uh, vulnerability, like a severe CVE. So, Basically, basically, there are four kind of checks for the provenance part. Yeah, deployment time check, but three for provenance, one for vulnerability. So I can take that. Uh, so internally, we do mirroring of most of the open source packages and repos. So we 
eventually, so obviously it doesn't go through our build pipelines because those are open source. So we won't have provenance for those builds, uh, but for artifacts and making sure those are internally signed, that's what we will make sure we do it as part of provenance check. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, it's always a challenge to get a lot of folks working on things like this because it's, unless say, you are attacked, there's not a lot of value you can prove to the execs. Uh, so I would say around four to five people uh, working on this. And this is not a full time, or that's not the only project they work on. So it varies. And I would say around 60% has worked on this project over the past three years or so. And like, which, which part of Seattle is that? Is that like people, 60% of somebody who's supposed to implement the developer implement new features, or a platform engineering team? Like, what team is it? So we are the paranoid security team. So within that, we are the engineering uh, pillar. So we work primarily on building security and DevSecOps tools to uh, make sure the infrastructure is set up. So. Out of that, around four to five of us work on this part. Yeah, I want to add on that because we have already finished most part, uh, mostly the coding part or the infrastructure building part. Now we are more focused on how to increase an adoption number, how to collect those numbers from our system and uh, make a list of them that inform the engineers to improve the, the, their, their system. Yeah, good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, when a CI/CD job tries to push an artifact which it generates to Artifactory or uh, OCI registry, we we need to make sure or we need to explicitly ask the Artifactory to only allow artifacts generated by pipeline X instead of pipeline Y being sending it to it. So if let's say there is a node package which uh, has authorization to uh, be created by pipeline X, uh, Artifactory would have that information. So we can map the image ID with the pipeline ID. And that's how we ensure that only the images uh, which are marked will be allowed to be published as part of the pipeline. Yeah, does, does that answer your question? And Right. No, no, Graphiast has an authorization. Like we, uh, internally, we use a product called Essence. It is also a source uh, product. It's a kind of RBAC, RBAC system. This is also a CSF product. <laughs> so you can find it in the, in the website. And um, every time we send the provenance to the Graphiast database, we actually send a kind of a mission request to the essence, and uh, if we can get uh, that uh, permission, they can just put the provenance into the database. Otherwise, it, it cannot. So yeah, that's what we did. OK, yeah, so next one. Yeah. Yeah, I think those decisions were made way before we actually did it, and that's been happening for a long time. But we are now, now with Cosine and Sixtor uh, being widely adopted, we are looking at uh, exploring that solution of having either short-lived keys or ephemeral keys by going the keyless route to use those instead. Yeah, firstly, it could be just uh, use Cosine with long-lived sign keys. But finally, we can gradually uh, add some record infrastructure to uh, achieve the keyless signing. So it's, uh, it's not an easy path to go, but we will gradually work towards that. No, yeah, it, I don't think it's a requirement, and I may be wrong again, but uh, 
we are working with the right folks within Yahoo to make sure it, we change because it's been Yahoo's been around for so long. Uh, it's and the open source tools have been coming in recently as well. So it's a change of say, uh, learning curve as well. So that's what we're working on. Uh, Sorry, sir. Yeah. Go ahead. So we, we've we just started collecting those and doing the vulnerability checks. The plan is to tie the S-bombs with the uh, freshness policy so that as, as we ensure that an image or an artifact cannot be deployed for more than six months, uh, which is a stale image, uh, having an S-bomb which uh, is older than six months also may not add value because we won't have any artifacts which are running for old, which are older than six months. So the plan is to have it either for a year or so because teams may have exceptions or uh, allowed, they are allowed to deploy an older image. So, but yeah, we, that's more policy question than a developer or an uh, engineer question, I feel like, so yeah. And we are not sending the vulnerability data or SBOM data in the build time to any database right now. We are actually collecting the vulnerability data, but it is from an async resource to, to, uh, to, uh, for the vulnerability data. It's not from the build stage. Uh, I, go, go ahead. You know. So to answer your first question, uh, so we we use internally Gripe and SIF to generate the SBOM and vulnerability data. And currently, it uh, spits out a lot of information about vulnerabilities, so ranging from critical to medium level. And we use that information along with uh, the information which the vulnerability team within Yahoo generates, which, which may determine not all vulnerabilities are critical to Yahoo. And it can shortlist those. So we then determine based on the vulnerabilities which Yahoo marks at as critical and with what SIF generates. And then based on that, we make a decision whether to block that image or uh, just report it and continue processing. Right now, it's implemented internally uh, because this is more of a build time check and not deployment. Uh, the, okay, the time is of the essence, so, but I think we are out of time, but thanks for your question. Uh, you had a follow-up question as well. We can... Yeah, it's just a create time, and uh, just based on create time right now, we have a plan to um, uh, check all the components, create time all the, of uh, every components. Uh, so yeah, we are just working on that. We haven't have a final solution for that. All right. Uh, uh, we can take the questions offline. I think we are out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat the question once more? So we currently integrate our, uh, the SD command which Screwdriver provides with all the standard templates. So before it gets published to Artifactory, uh, we've integrated that SD command to all, all of the existing pipelines. So it gets scanned and determines whether to proceed to publish it or not. So yeah, we use, uh, as mentioned, gripe SIF to get that information and some proprietary code to figure out whether to push or not.
think we are done thank you guys thank you guys